Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 190. Wow, we're coming up on 200, guys. This episode is with my friend Libby Letlow Gray. She's an actor, director, puppeteer, and all-around badass lady. In this episode, we talk about her recent marriage to previous guest, Walt Gray IV, starting acting at a very young age, working on Masked Rider, how she got into puppetry, working with Malcolm McDowell and Richard Hatch, her love of theater, surviving a house fire, and so much more. Libby is fantastic, and you are going to love her. So, without further ado, let's just jump right into this one. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 190, with Libby Letlow Gray. Theme song time. to set me up in the office today <laughs> with the fancy microphone and i was like listen needs it? i don't want people to think <laughs> that i'm like some kind of professional here all right same same i appreciate that we, we have a professional in the house and it's walter gray the fourth let's be honest exactly who are we who are we trying to impress here he thinks people listen to this <laughs> i'm wearing can i bring my dog of course sure. is that is that him behind you is that Murphy in the bed? <gasps> Look at the baby boy. Oh, my God. Listen, he doesn't know me, but I would give my life for him. I feel that way about Kubo. Yeah, so, he's he's camouflaged know. right now, but he's he's there. He's the exact same color <laughs> I as see his him. bed. Kubo. I love it. There I love is. that. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> hey, he's like, what, dad? <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm split. I mean, that's how like Murphy is. Of course. Murphy is upset because Walt's, Walt's not home and I'm not paying attention to him. So he's like, well, I understand. I'd be upset if Walt wasn't home, too. I'm just... I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> How's your day going? Uh, it's good. I mean, you're you're looking at it. This, this is this is the uh, the life of an unemployed person. <laughs> the life of a married unemployed person. Congratulations. Well, this is a, a newly a newly married unemployed yeah. person. How does it feel? Does it feel different? No. Everybody yeah. oh, actually why Walt has the perfect response for this. Okay. He says in, in the best possible way, no. I love that. So how's the week been? I haven't seen you in a week. And last time I saw you, I was very drunk. Which I okay. You're like Walt. Am I? In the fact that I don't know he's drunk until he tells me. And I did yes. not know that you were drunk until the very end when you're like, I'm very yes. drunk. And even then I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> because I had one, I had one friend there who got sh- wasted. <laughs> I, I will not name names. Sure. Uh, I was holding them up, Amazing. waiting for their plus one to, <laughs> to carry them out. Yeah, it was it's like, can I get you some water? Yes. Sure. Okay. Can I, can I hold you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All of that. You were not there. You were, you know, I'm drunk, but I'm happy yeah. and I'm having a good time. And I got to see all my buddies and I'm, I did. All right. Peace out guys. <laughs> that was the level of drunk you are. Yes. The level of drunk they were was. <laughs> gravity is fighting against them. They, they were fighting against gravity and gravity was winning. I had a good time. So yeah. But uh, no, the week has been. It has been very chill. Um, like I said, after the after the wonderful celebration, I oh, did yeah. get a diagnosis of bronchitis. Nice. Um, so I have been I've been on antibiotics. I've had my inhaler. I've been fighting it off. It's been super duper fun. But at the same time, Walt and I have been so productive. We're having oh, a big go. yard sale next weekend. We are getting rid of so much stuff. We've cleared it, and we've had we have five bookshelves in our living room amazing five bookshelves take up two walls Uh, I mean we have like we have like a sidebar in between one of them but we were able to at least clear off one entire bookshelf and we're going to get rid of that and all of the books that were on it or like interspersed between other books we we you know went through our entire collection uh 
so we're doing that. We we got that cool new bar piece that you saw. Oh, like yeah. The picture of the new so shelving awesome. unit. Because our, our bar originally was just this little sideboard. It was tiny. Sure. It was short. And it was getting so crowded. Sure. Stuff. <laughs> and you're married now. So you we got expand. that. We put it. Yeah. I get <laughs> expand, it. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So yeah, we put that section. up. We cleaned out. We cleaned out some cabinets and and got our pretty glassware out that's been hiding. Cool. And we were able to. Oh no. We were able to display the beautiful <laughs> piece that you got for us. I did. I did. So, I yeah. mean, man, you get married, and I like you both a lot. Is it, it just seemed well, like here's the right the thing. thing to do. <laughs> our our wedding ended up being very very lord of the rings themed anyway which we were not initially intending but you got us that piece and our friend our dear friend uh marianne got us this beautiful stained glass hanging uh piece of the even star and my present to walt which happens to be right here oh um, i did not plan it that way <laughs> uh i had a, i commissioned this by a friend who made it for us what um, so it, it has our names and our wedding date and we got the ring, but it says, uh, Arwen's quote of, I would rather oh my spend God. one lifetime with you than face all the ages of man alone. And the, the oh. beautiful work is based on some of the tapestries that are hanging in Arwen's bedroom. Yeah. Oh my God. So. It's like you guys were meant to be. <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, I have to tell you something. Tell me something. I have to tell you something. When Walt and I first started talking, this was before we even went on our first date. Uh -huh. I knew that he was a big Lord of the Rings fan. Sure. And I told him, I said, I have to, I have to apologize to you ahead of time. I said, I'm not like a really big Lord of the Rings fan. Ooh, and you're still here. I love Star Wars. I have Star Wars tattooed on my body. I same, same. love it with a passion. And I roped Walt into like continuing to date me because I had a free Star Wars ticket. There you go. But he was like, oh, "All right, well, that's that's like a that's a really big red flag. <laughs> that you don't like Lord of the Rings." <laughs> and I was like, "You know, though, it's been years. I hadn't I hadn't seen the movies since they were like in theaters. Maybe, maybe I had like caught Fellowship here sure. and there at friends' houses or on TV." But I had not actively sought out to watch them. Sure. So when we started dating, like every time he would talk about it, he would get so excited about it. And so we finally sat down and I hadn't seen any of the director's cuts at all. Oh, wow. Only theatricals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Only theatricals. So I committed. We sat down and we watched all of them. And we even watched like the supplemental footage. Amazing. It changed me. I mean, I'm the one who suggested... God, I think two years ago, at some point during the pandemic, we did it again. We did a huge marathon, and Walt actually planned out Hobbit meals with every single oh my God. one. No wonder you married him. I think we watched I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so many other reasons. Yeah, so many other but that's reasons. the top one. Yeah. And I then, like, it. last year, we did it again. And then this year, I was... <laughs> God, even I was just like, uh, it's Thanksgiving weekend. We're not doing anything. We're not going out of town because we had been so peopled out sure from from the wedding and the celebration and the honeymoon i was mm -hmm. like let's just watch lord of the rings and we did all of them in a day yes yes <laughs> and Amazing. we don't usually do that we usually spread it out over like two days but we did all of them in a day Ooh. we finished we we started a little late we didn't start till like 10 a.m maybe 11 and we got we like finished right at midnight amazing you felt like you went on a journey <laughs> again yeah. For another time. <laughs> it's so good. It's incredible. Again, I've I've also Star Wars tattoos, Star Wars all day long. But yeah, the, the perfect trilogy is Lord of the Rings. And it holds up just as well 20 years later. It's like it makes no sense how good it is. And just watching it after so many years. I mean, my God, what is it? Like Towers or Return of the King? Is it there? It's like 20th, 21st anniversary. I don't remember. I think it's Return of anyway. the King. Anyway. No, it's two towers because oh one was fellowship and we're in twenty two. I'm bad at math. Heck, I mean, my twenty years after, and it still looks as incredible as it looks, and it right. feels incredible as it feels, and cry every time. It's absolutely timeless. It it that is that is probably the like the most epic film series ever. I would say. I agree. Did Walt walk out to concerning hobbits at your wedding ceremony? He did. Uh, wow. What was your song? Mine was Leia's theme. 
Ooh, good choice. How was the ceremony? <laughs> oh, magical. Yeah. It was honestly every like I God, we've had two years to plan this. I mean, they were pandemic years, so they like go far. They were there, <laughs> so they were very long. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to sound cliche because I have been married before. Sure. But there there are always things that I think people who have a desire to be married mm -hmm. have ideas in their head already of like, what would I want this to look like? What would I want this to be? And I have always told myself, if I got married again, I want to get married in this specific place. Right. Um, and so we did. We got married in uh, Love at Lovers Point Park in Pacific Grove, which is part of Monterey, California. Mm -hmm. um, and it's where I spent every single one of my childhoods into adulthood because my grandparents had a house right across the street from the park. And my mom was able to rent that house out um, for the wedding because both of my grandparents have passed. And that house, unfortunately, had to be sold. But we sold it to a company that has it as a rental property because it's right on the ocean front. Sure. So, of course, they would. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my mom was able to to rent the house. So I got to get ready in in my grandparents home. Like it was really, really special. Oh, that's beautiful. But yeah, we so we got married at that park, which is what I wanted. It was uh, threatening to rain all week long. And then the day before it was like no more rain. But then we did have 20 mile per hour winds. But that's OK. <laughs> uh, the, the wind was perfect. It made my dress you know, blow in, in, in the, uh, in the breeze. It was gorgeous. And we had a quartet and, and we had a bagpiper. Um, oh dude. So yeah. Amazing. <laughs> it was everything I wanted. Cause with wedding ceremonies, I mean, a million things can go wrong. You're peaked stressed. Cause what could happen with rain thinking my wedding was the same way. They're like, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It ended up being overcast just long enough for the ceremony. And then it, we got out of there and it, oh, was, it worked out. It's one of those things where you're like, uh, j let's just do this. Yeah. And it just, the universe worked it out. We rented a tent as a contingency just in case. Smart. And then we ended up not needing it. So there you go. Yeah, that's good. That's You're great. still married. It worked out. <laughs> <laughs> One month later. Yeah. Still going strong. Woohoo. So there was a week in between, if I remember correctly. It was like, you were, no, it was a month. You guys went traveling. You did a bunch of cool stuff. Yeah, we went on our honeymoon. What? How was that? Um, the first week was great. The second no. week I was sick as a dog. Oh, no. <laughs> but here's the thing. The first week was like the honeymoon part. And we went to sure. Maine, which is where Walt spent all of his childhood summers. Oh, so we like went from the place where I spent my childhood summers to where he spent his childhood summers. Boom. Um, and... It was gorgeous. We had beautiful weather. We we took so many sweaters and coats uh, and boots and thick <laughs> socks and did not need a single one because it was like in the high 60s, low 70s. Sure. And I was like, oh, this is great. But we were also like, where's our fall weather? <laughs> right. um, I think we got two days of rain. And both of those days were days that we were traveling. Um, oh, boom. We, we flew to Maine, rented a car, and then drove to uh we drove to pennsylvania where walt is originally from and then mm -hmm. down to kentucky and tennessee to see family oh awesome yeah it was lovely the the only issue is is that i was sick but i didn't have covid i was really Good. careful around the people that i was that i was seeing and everything sure. um and the last part of our trip i pretty much just stayed in bed Got to and recoup when a little he was bit. driving i would just sleep in the car yeah yeah but the, the first week of it was great the first week of it was great we had so much fun and ate so much lobster oh yeah which is all i wanted oh, <laughs> you went to the right place for it you can't go to maine and not have lobster that's true it's in the contract as soon as you go into the I state mean, yeah i understand and ben and jerry's ice cream ah boom very important i love that <laughs> And hey, you tested the vowels right off the bat, you know, in sickness and in health. And he's like, all right, here we go. We're fast forwarding this that's part. Exact, that's literally <laughs> what I said. Is it? <laughs> that's literally what I said. I was Let's like, see well, if you meant what you said although, the other day. I mean, we, didn't... <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have, we actually didn't have um, the traditional vows. We both wrote our own oh, even personal better. vows. And my, my aunt... Uh, was the one who married us. She was our officiant. Oh, cool. She said some really beautiful stuff. She uh -huh. let us say our vows. We exchanged rings and then it was done. 
Boom. That's it. Did he try to use that then when you're like sickness and in health? He's like, that wasn't in my vows, Libby. I purposely left that part out <laughs> just in case. I mean, I think we both we both had some kind of variation of, you know, sure. I'll take care of you. Sure. That kind of thing. It was so. implied. You know, it was implied. <laughs> it's implied. <laughs> That's awesome. So then he came back and then a month later we had the party. We we can't well no i mean because we were on the trip for two weeks we only had then two weeks left to plan for the party oh um and there was goodness. still lots to do i you know i made all of the centerpieces and Did all you? of the um libby what is happening you're supposed mm -hmm. to relax after you get married <laughs> and you're like how about no, now? <laughs> we we came back and immediately went to work we're like okay we got to get those table posters done we got to make sure that we have everything ordered. We got to get the popcorn ordered. We got to stuff all of the the caramel corn party favors. We yeah. got to make sure that my God. You know, this is a, and Walt, sweet dear Walt, my God, he <laughs> hand wrote every single one of those name tags. I was wondering he wait, hold that on. Was, His handwriting is too good. My trust in him. His handwriting is, is down. gorgeous. How? No, Why? don't. No, his handwriting is beautiful. And I write like I have broken hands. <laughs> well, I guess the yin yang of it all. Somebody has to. Yeah. Interesting. I listen, I am crafty. I am very sure. crafty. My handwriting is terrible. You can make the tags, but you're not going to write on them. Look at you guys. You're the perfect team. <laughs> and I didn't even make the tags. Those were, you know, <laughs> store bought. No, he did it. He was, he was brilliant. We also had to, we had to do the seating chart and, right. you know, when people RSVP for a wedding, <laughs> it's usually understood that you'll come. Yes. Especially when we say like, we need to make sure that you're coming the week before, because that's when all right. of the vendors need all sure. of the correct numbers for everything. So you're totally. not overpaying mm -hmm. for food and drinks you're not going to use. Makes sense. Um, Every single one of the cancellations that we got happened within the week. Of the, oh, of the no. party. Oh, so, no. Yeah. And then Walt kept having to change tags and having to move. <laughs> oh, no. We're oh. like, where are these people are going to sit now? This table's going to be completely empty. Oh, it's crazy. But we also understand it was, I mean, family emergencies, illness. It's that time of year. People sure. are starting to get sick. Totally get it. So it's like, sure. you can't really hold it against anybody. You can't. But at the same time, it, it makes, no, it just makes, you know, doing table seating charts which is like the worst part i think oh yeah of any sure. party like that doing seating charts is always the worst it makes that part the most difficult and because sure. it was like the one it was like the main thing that fell on his shoulders he was just like i swear if one more person cancels i'm gonna just like <laughs> oh, no. tear every single one of these up. <laughs> like, please don't please don't do it well not to throw myself under the bus but uh I think I think I sat in my seat for like uh, fifteen seconds, maybe. <laughs> well, did you eat at your chair? Did so you sit down and eat. I may have. Or been, did you go outside with the I, other? I so I was with people. Yuri the first half of the night because we just uh -huh. hung out, and then we spent most of the night in of the course. alleyway because you know, as you do, yeah. and uh, and then the second half of the night I was with Sandra, so I just hung out with her the whole night uh -huh. at yes. her table. So I, I was like, Sandra. I don't know where my love seat is, but five, six drinks in, I, I don't know where I am. Do you remember what your quote was? I do. I do, actually, because it was Lord of the Rings. Oh, well, there. So you were you were you would have been at the Lord of the Rings table. I was. That's why I, I dropped my program there. And I was like, cool, this is my seat. And then and then it's it was lost. And you to never the night. went back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We we kind of had a feeling um you and our friend our friend Noel actually who came and watched um Willow the other night. Amazing. We we kind of had a feeling we were like anywhere we put them they're going to yeah. get along with anybody <laughs> that we see them by. Yeah. So, it was really easy. And and that's the thing is like most of most of it was very easy to place people at at tables. Sure. The hard part was like trying to figure out what quote to give them sure um you know what what table we thought would like they would have the most fun at other like people that they knew but Walt also wanted to like mix things up and go well these people see each other all the time let's try and like make right. them talk to new people <laughs> but it, honestly it was an amazing group it was an amazing mix of of folks and it was incredible it's it, the like the, from the moment I walked down the stairs with Walt I just didn't care anymore about all the stress 
yeah. of like the day and getting it ready and everything. So who cares? Who, who cares? cares? It was a fun party. Agreed. You had who the cares? best entrance I've ever seen in any wedding. It was awesome. <laughs> Except our spotlight was supposed to follow us and the guy slowed it down so much that we were like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't so matter. Fast. It doesn't so matter. Fast. It was hilarious. It, it was great. It was great. <laughs> I was just walking in an normal speed. I couldn't walk that fast. I had heels on. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Rule number one of heels. Don't walk that fast. It was cool, though. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a room full of actors. And I didn't realize until you had told me at the smokehouse that you uh, started acting really young. And in between when we met back in September to seeing you uh -huh. again uh, a week ago, I was on a Libby marathon. <laughs> I know. Walt told me. I watched every episode of Masked Rider that you were on. And oh I was like, God. look at Libby. She's so young. That's like 28 episodes, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, was Out of like bit. two seasons. It was a bit. Yeah. I mean, and also you had the, you had the best role out of all of them. And I'm not just saying that because I'm legally obligated, but you got to get pied in the face. You got to wear a giant bug costume. I got to be slimed. Yeah. Like, first off, how does that happen? Was it your idea to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to start acting early on or where your parents like, you should try this Libby. Oh God. Oh God. No, no, no. It was all me. Um, <laughs> I was from a very young age. I I think I was just like the family ham. Sure. Like I was, I'm Why here, not? here's the thing. My, my aunt was also an actress and a playwright. Oh, um, my father was, was an actor. He did a lot of theater. My yeah. aunt is still a playwright. She's, she's amazing. I mean, she oh. has plays all over the country. My dad was also an actor. He did a lot. He did tons and tons of theater. Um, and my mom did a little bit of theater back in, oh, back cool. in the day, but not nearly as much as like my dad. But we were such a, my family's just such a family of hams anyway. We all, every, every time we get together, we all end up singing. We all end up quoting movies. My grandfather quoted movies like crazy. Amazing. Um, and that, the, the, the movie quote tables was my idea, but that's an idea that I've actually had for years. Cool. Um, because there was like a part, there was one part of me at one point period or another where I was like, I really want to be a wedding planner, but I wanted to specifically do themed weddings. Sure. Um, so that was just one of those things that was like in, in the back of my head for a very long time. So yeah, just a big group of hams. That's yeah. my family. <laughs> but I specifically was like the performer. Yeah. Um, my favorite movie as a child were it, The Wizard of Oz and Annie. I watched those on a loop over and over. You could not get me to watch anything else. Sure. Um, I wanted I wanted to be part of Annie so bad. Uh, <laughs> and when I would go play pretend outside, I had a little stuffed dog and I had a little blue gingham dress and I would go out and pretend to be Dorothy all the time. Amazing. So it was like those two things. When I was four, uh, my family moved, I say back to Bakersfield, but that's because that's where my parents actually met originally. My dad was in junior college there when my mom was in high school. Got it. But they had both moved and had their own lives and everything. We moved back there uh, to be closer to my grandparents, but also because my parents um, had both gotten their teaching credentials and that's where the teacher jobs were at the time. So we were moving from Northern California to Bakersfield. So when I was four, we moved to Bakersfield and my my mom had gotten in touch with her old high school drama teacher. Nice. And the high school was doing this play called Computer Christmas. Amazing. And my dad, who he's just a big dude with a wonderful, hearty laugh. They asked him to be Santa Claus. <laughs> um, and at the time, they were also looking for some little kids in the community. Um, mm. And we lived right down the street from this high school. They were looking for some little kids to play bunny rabbits. Perfect. Um, so at four years old, I did a play with my dad and I was a bunny rabbit. Look at that. And he was Santa Claus. And you were in. And then after that, I was like, the bug bit me. I did, I think the next year she did like, um, she did Babes in Toyland. And I got to play Little Red Riding Hood. And after that, uh, my parents heard about a new magnet school in Bakersfield um, called Mount Vernon Magnet Performing Arts School. Oh. And they asked me before I started the first grade, they said, hey, this is a really neat school. Like it's it's just regular school during the day. But after that, you can take different kinds of performing arts classes. And I was like, yes. And they're like, okay, well, let's think about it. I said, no, yes, we're doing this. I want to do it. 
at, sure. you know, all of I've decided. five and a half years old. <laughs> well, I mean, I was very, very precocious. <laughs> I feel you. Good. Um, so I went to that school uh, from first grade through sixth grade, and I took drama. I took choir. I took dance classes, ballet, tap, jazz, wow. um, piano lessons, all of it um, huh. until I was 12 when I left that. And then, uh, you know, I started, I just went to a normal junior high. They didn't really have performing arts classes in junior high, but you get to do Shakespeare in your English classes. But that's when I discovered the very, very rich community theater population that Bakersfield has. We have so many community theaters there. Tons. And I have worked with almost every single one of them throughout my, my life at some point or another. But yeah, I, I started when I was very young. Look at you. I love that you're like, this is what I'm doing. Put me in the school. And the fact that there was a school like that. I, oh my God, I was so lucky. I was so lucky because there are so many, so many talented people throughout this entire country who just don't have access Facts. to theater or to just performing arts programs in general and it's it's so sad we pour all of this money into sports and just none left for the arts and i mean there's not even enough money for stem programs in the country i feel like you know it's like yeah science uh, performing arts whatever sports though yeah let's get them sports balls they need the monies it's wild yeah it's insane to me so you're doing theater and a bunch of stuff growing up and then Mm -hmm. Masked Rider just was that in Bakersfield? No, that that was shot. Um, that was shot in Valencia, that same place okay. where they shot Power Rangers, and because it sense. was a Heim Saban yep, spinoff Saban. show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got that because I went to a open call. Sweet for just this man, this manager who was coming into town looking for new talent, and she did like this little workshop. Um, and I went up there. I think I was thirteen or fourteen at the time when I mm-hmm. met her. And, um, I just, I read a, I read some commercial copy for her and cool. she liked me a lot and immediately signed me and she got me this audition for masked writer. And here's the thing. It was the kiss of death. It was my first audition ever. And I booked it. Uh... The problem was, is I auditioned for the role of Molly, who was the lead oh, actress on the yeah. show, huh. the sister. Yeah. And that's the role I booked. Um, oh. And then a few months later, they said, hey, Libby, we want you to come back and read for this other role. Hmm. I found out that the girl that was playing Molly, she was actually in contract negotiations and they needed a backup just in case. Oh. Um, so I was the backup to play the role in case her contract negotiations fell through. Oh. Um, but I guess they went through. OK, so I came in and played Patsy. But honestly, I'm so happy that I did because it was it's the a one. way funner role. It's the way better role. I was not in every single episode, but I do not care. I had the best time. I bet. Was it different than you expected? Because it's a TV role and you're coming from like children's theater. Like the it's still acting, but it's a different like medium. It absolutely was. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I think I had I think I've always had this inherent knowledge of what making TV and movies was like. I think I've seen at at that point at 15 years old, I think I had seen enough behind the scenes stuff. Sure. um, Because I was always interested in in how movies and television were made. But I definitely got the, you know, I definitely got the note of, hey, Libby, you need to pull it back just a little bit. You don't have to be so loud. You don't have to be so (laughs) animated. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) It's screen, not stage. And I went, oh, okay. So obviously that you know, I got that note very early on, but that note stuck with me. I'm still very animated. <laughs> same, know, same time. But I do know how to pull it in a little bit. But it, yeah, it was a different world, but it was a different world in the sense that I actually coming from such a theatrical background, I was more interested in what was going on behind the scenes than actually filming oh, okay. my scenes. Sure. I would go in and I'd be like, okay, say my lines, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I get to act, yay. And sure. then I'd go and, you know, I'd do school. But there would be hours where you're sitting around not doing anything and mm-hmm. you're talking to crew members. And I just wanted to know what everybody did. I'm like, what does a grip do? What does a best boy sure. do? You know? While you're there, might and as well that, learn. That was the fun stuff. Yeah. 
might as well learn. So I got to I, that that knowledge and education at such a young age was invaluable. I bet. Did you know there was going to be like a return gig, like the size of it when you signed on? No, I mean we only we only did two seasons. That was sure. it. That and that's that's pretty short lived. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, what was really really difficult was balancing out school and and oh, filming yeah. because I wasn't on set enough to be homeschooled full time. Uh, but I wasn't at my high school enough to really do well in my classes. And this sure. was a, I for me this is not like tooting my own horn, but growing up even in the magnet program and everything, my my grades you had to hold a certain grade mm, in order to, okay. con- to continue to be in the magnet program. Sure. And so I was always a straight A student. Um, and then the same thing in junior high, I was in the gifted program for like some of elementary and into junior high. And so I always had like, you know, A's and B's. And when I got into high school, I was fine my freshman year, but then I started slipping once my sophomore and junior year came around and I was doing the show, my grades started to get really bad, but it was, it wasn't necessarily out of a place of like, I can't keep up with my schoolwork or I'm, I'm not catching everything. For me, Mm -hmm. it was out of a place of, um, I don't care about sure. my schoolwork because I'm doing something that I am more passionate about. Sure. But because of all of that, my grades were slipping and my parents were not happy about that. Them both being teachers, of course. Um, I did have to go, I had to go to the producer and be like, hey, I gotta, I gotta get off the show. But oh. he was like, well, the show's, the show's gonna get canceled after the season <laughs> oh, anyway, no. so don't worry about <laughs> it. And I'm like, all right, well, there we go. I guess it doesn't matter. Oh, man. So yeah, then I, you know, I went back to my normal life in high school and continued to do community theater. And I was just known around town as that one girl that was on that Power Rangers show. And I kept telling everyone, it's, it's not Power Rangers, it's Masked Rider. There's a difference. Totally different. Like, (laughs) not even close to the same. Totally different. Was that weird? Because you like, had like a season of your life that was very different than regular life and then going back to it. Yeah, it was strange. It it was strange also in the way that it's going to sound terrible. <laughs> it was strange also in the way that um, because I had been doing theater most of my life, uh, you know, that there is a part of you. I mean, I started I started learning Shakespeare when I was in elementary school because my parents taught it. Sure. It was just one of those things that I was around all the time. Um. And there were dramatic roles that I was starting to do early sure. in life. Um, and then you do a show like Masked Writer, and I'm sitting here going like, I know Shakespeare, and I am saying <laughs> these, this absolute ridiculous stuff. And sure. it's a kid's television show. And, you know, when you hit like 15, 16, 17, mm-hmm. you're sitting here going like, oh, my God, I'm doing a kid's television show. Sure. I'm already want, an adult. I don't want to be known for this. <laughs> right. I felt ridiculous saying the line sometimes. And I just sure. did not want to be. I didn't want that to be the peak. And I didn't sure. want that to be my 15 minutes of fame. And I did not. And I didn't want it to be the thing that I was known for, totally. especially when I did come back and tried to start doing theater again and wanting to dig into, you know, juicier roles and things. I don't want people to go like masked writer, like, right. <laughs> who are you? What are right. you doing? Why would I put you in this role? So sure. Anyway. See, if I was casting those things, I'd be like, was Furbis cool or was he a diva? I need to Okay. Know. Paul Pastore, who was the puppeteer and voice of Furbis, is one of the nicest humans on the face of oh, the planet. So good. And to he's hear. actually one of the reasons that I got into puppetry later later on in life. I was gonna ask. I was like, is this is we'll, this we'll where it there. started? Because he's right there. We'll get there. No, no, it's not where it started. I promise. Cool. It's not where it started. Cool. But he's he's such a cool guy. Furbis was cool. Furbis was the best. And I am convinced that Furbies are based on Furbis. Okay. So when I was watching it, I was like, oh cool. Furbis, Furby, he kind of looks like a Furby. And then I looked at the dates of when it came out. I'm like, something happened here. Let's put our tinfoil hats on. I swear to God, whoever created Furbies, because Furbies were not a thing before before Master Rider. They didn't come out to like, what, 1997. I think it's like the first time I saw a Furby. Yeah. And I went, that thing looks suspiciously <laughs> I've like seen you before. <laughs> the puppet on our show. He has a beak. Yep. He's furry. He's got ears. He's got a beak. He's got a jewel in the middle of the forehead and he's mm-hmm. got those big eyes. And I went, 
this is some rip off. Yeah. BS. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. They just took yeah. Furbis and made him tiny and demonic and boom, sold it to and the And he masses. has the same exact voice. It's the yeah. same like little voice and he says very similar things. Yeah. I mean, it's mm, like, I don't like it. Hear me out, Libby. What if Furbis is the Mogwai to the Furby gremlin? <laughs> Think about this. God, I Somebody hope fed not. Furbis after midnight or got him wet and then just put his babies he in the boxes. He got wet and he just he spored. Oh. Yes. He spored That's where these came from. We figured it out. It took 25 years, <laughs> but we figured it out. Well, they are terrifying. They, they are, are terrifying. Yes. Furbies are terrifying. Furbies I don't like them. Ones. Not in. Mm -mm. But for bus, I love. Yeah. I have a, I have a very soft spot. We're, we're team Furbus over Furbis. here all day. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> was there a little performer as well as a puppet? Yes. Okay. It, do you know who it was? Did you look it up? No. I was looking at Libby stuff. <laughs> He was he was portrayed by the late Vern Troyer. What? Mini Me was Furbus. Mini Me was this when he was in costume and you saw him walking around. That was yeah. Vern Troyer. I I met Vern Troyer obviously on set. Um, he was not famous yet, and it wasn't until a couple of years later when I saw Austin Powers. Like I saw a trailer for it. Sure. I was in the movie theater with like my friend or my boyfriend or something at the time. I was in the movie theater. I saw the trailer for Austin Powers. I saw Mini Me and I went, holy shit, like really loud in the middle of the theater. And everybody's like, look at me. And I'm like, oh God, sorry. I was like, I was like, oh my God, that's Vern. That's Vern. That's the guy. That's the little. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, I'll tell you later. That's insane. But yeah, that was Vern Troyer. Wow. Do you have do you have a favorite episode or gag? Oh gosh. Um you had a bunch. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if you seen if you saw when I got pied in the face, I smile a little bit afterwards because I was not expecting it. <laughs> and the director's like, Libby, don't smile. But I couldn't <laughs> help it. I had never gotten a pie in the face before. Sure. Um, God, I I love the I love the dance contest episode. Solid. The the tango. Um, I also love the Oh, the ice cream! The Ooh. ice, the uh, I get possessed and and go after the ice cream truck. Good one. one. That's one of my favorite episodes, and I'm covered in ice cream when I come back in, just like you know, manic about ice cream. Um, I think one of my other favorites was oh, the detention one. I love that one. That one, that one was really really fun. I like your bug costume. <laughs> Everything with the giant bug. Thing. Everybody loves a bug costume. How you know, you it's not? funny when uh, I land on my back and like my hands are doing that. It's not me. That's really? actually, they could. Yeah. They wouldn't allow me to do that. It was considered. I don't know. It's not even like a stunt, it's a stunt. but that's actually our stunt coordinator. That's our stunt coordinator incredible. in the Michi Yamamoto. Like if you look really close, <laughs> you fall back and your hands turn into grown man hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a split second it's a split second but it, it oh, exists that's all you need you see these are yeah, these, yeah. these are my favorite things to learn it's like when you see that uh Aomir sword fall up falls out of the hilt and they just keep going it's like these little things libby had man hands for a frame i'm in libby has fingernails in a frame too because um the double for molly had to do an insert of a hand pulling perfume out of a purse uh-huh i remember that one and those are not my hands. They just forgot to get the insert, so they had her do it. That's incredible. But it is interesting. I mean, I uh, I I remember. I think it's just because it's it's you know it's one of those defining moments in your career. I remember almost every line from every episode that I had to say. It's awesome. It's sad. It's sad, <laughs> but it's awesome. No, it's awesome, Libby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You got masked rider for a bit, and then you go back to normal life. And then how soon after into your normal life did Bubba and Sissy happen? Oh my Didn't god! Didn't see that coming, Bubba did you? Sissy, no. <laughs> <laughs> did I watch it? Yes, I did. So, Bubba and Sissy was actually a play that happened. They they wanted to do oh. kind of a Tony oh. and Tina get married thing. Okay, which is okay. funny because I ended up doing Tony and Tina's a, a, Boom. a couple of years before Bubba and Sissy, I think. Um, Bubba and Sissy, Bubba, Bubba and Sissy. Wow, <laughs> I like Bubba and uh, Sissy. Was now. a play, and I I was not involved in that play um those were some friends of mine part of uh, one of the theater companies who had done it i i was not involved with it because i was doing theater with a different company at the time and then the guy who wrote it and directed it decided he wanted to make it into a short film nice um and that was where i came in at the time i so i think i was 19 
Okay. When I did Bub and Sissy, I, w- I was in college. I was in college and and just doing you know theater around town, but everybody knew me. Sure. Um, because when you have been doing theater in Bakersfield, California, sure for fifteen years of your life, people know you. You get around. Um, <laughs> you get around. Your your name gets out there. Uh, so yeah, I <laughs> did Bub and Sissy get it <laughs> at age nineteen, and, and we filmed. You know, we filmed that just in different locations in Bakersfield. It was actually mostly at one location um, at like an Elks Lodge, but <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> oh boy that it's a different that it's a different movie. project than uh than uh masked rider i think in a couple ways it's, it's different. a different project than <laughs> pretty much everything else i've ever done yeah. yeah so you're 19 with bubba and sissy 19 had puppetry synced in yet no puppetry didn't come in until i was 30 really yeah yeah i found puppetry very late in life i need this story how what what made you want to do it oh Where gosh okay it? The impetus. You got it. You got it. So uh, I was in college doing Bubba and Sissy. Um, I dropped out a year later because I had a baby. Nice. Um, nice. <laughs> like you do. That'll do it. Field, California. <laughs> and North Carolina. That's a, that's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Yep. Um, Bakersfield is a, is a lovely, conservative, backwards town in the middle of a very progressive state. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, all of my friends who still live there are all very liberal, involved in the arts, or their teachers and educators. It's, right on. it's a strange thing. Um, so, so yeah, I moved down to LA, um, tried to get into commercials and television and film and stuff like that. And it just wasn't mm-hmm. happening. Um, and at 28 years old, I decided to return to college and get my, get oh. my degree. Um, so I came and I, I started at Glendale Community College and I got very involved in their theater department. Nice. Um, and my second year there, we did a Little Shop of Horrors oh, as cool. our spring musical. And I had just come off of the fall show uh, doing Streetcar and I had played oh, Blanche. Oh. And it was very you. exhausting. I, bet. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, want to have a meltdown on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very tired though from that show, and I was like, if we do the musical, I'm probably just gonna, I'll be chorus or something. I'm like, sure. I don't want to do anything too crazy. Mm-hmm. I had also just come off of a workshop though from, um, I was I was at the American College Theater Festival ACTF. Mm-hmm. And I had done like a little bit of a workshop with um, the Del Arte School up in Northern California. Oh. And their big thing is movement and, and Commedia Del Arte and sure. uh, puppetry. And they do, but they have like archery. They've got all this cool mask work. One of these things is not like really, the really others. Cool stuff. <laughs> um, but it's just an incredible program. And I, I was, I, I had been looking at it and I, I didn't do it, but I, I was very interested in it. So when I found out we were doing Little Shop, I was like, hmm, I wonder if they'll let me be the puppet. Ooh. And I had told the director, I said, I don't, I'm kind of interested in the puppetry side of this. And she said, okay, that's cool. And then we held auditions, you know, and I came in and I, I auditioned for the voice of Audrey because she specifically wanted a female voice cool. for Audrey too. Um, and then, you know, just, and I was not, I had forgotten about the conversation about puppetry by sure. the time we like got to auditions and everything. And I was like, oh, I'll just, I'll be chorus, something, whatever. And my friend, cause my friend Lisa got cast as the voice of Audrey too. And she was incredible. And then somebody said, well, Libby, you already have a part. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I already have a part. They're like, you're the puppeteer for the puppet. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> I'm like, wait, <laughs> really? They took that seriously? Yeah. I was like, okay. Why I'll not? I'll do it. Nobody at my community college knew how to teach puppetry. There was, there, you know, nobody was doing that. Nobody was, nobody was a puppeteer. And they rented this, they rented all of the, the puppets came in like a, a set from this rental oh, company. Okay. So you get the little, you get the little baby Audrey uh-huh. and then you get like another, a bigger Audrey too that uh, Seymour actually holds for a scene. And mm-hmm. then you get the Audrey that's like on the stage, but kind of like sitting down. And sure. then you get the giant, you know, Huge the giant old. guy. Yeah. We got it. And everybody's like, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> They're like, Libby, here's a DVD that came with the puppet. And I'm like, okay. Came with instructions. So I popped, 
I popped the DVD in and it tells you how to operate the puppet. What? All of the puppets. It tells you how to operate all of the puppets. So I, I just followed this DVD on how to operate these puppets. And I had to sync up all of my movement with the girl doing the voice. She did the voice live every night from the booth. Oh man! Up above, uh, like in the back of the theater, Oof. and it was. It, I mean, it's a big, it's a big theater. But yeah, I, I just sync up all of my my hand movements with her, and then when you get to the the second Audrey two puppet, the one that's on the floor, we actually had a chair on casters, so I could actually oh. dance as Audrey two on the floor. That's cool. Um, on these wheels. But like I had to, you know, also do this, Sure. <laughs> you know, put my arms up and down at the same time to her, to her voice. And then of course the very huge puppet, this thing is built for a man who's like six foot three. Oh, no. I am five foot seven. Let's mm -hmm. say that I'm five foot seven. I am tiny inside this thing. This thing swallows you. Yeah. This thing is meant for a very large person. Oh, no. But I do it. I get inside of it and I make myself as big as possible inside. Whenever I was on stage and I wasn't singing, mm -hmm. I was constantly moving to make it look like the puppet's breathing. Ooh. Nobody you. told me to do that. Nobody said, "Hey, this is how you make the puppet look like." But it's just stuff you figure out. It's just totally. stuff that as you're as you're rehearsing with this thing, as you're rehearsing with this entity, you just learn how it operates and how it works. And I wanted to make it as organic and lifelike as possible. But it's also incredibly hard because the way that the puppet worked is in order your hands are like in the top of the mouth, your feet are just standing up and the the bottom jaw is just jutting out on stage and then there's like curtains between your legs where people go through as they're getting eaten sure so all of the the movement of it talking is me moving up up and down my entire body oh. moving the puppet up and down so that's why i said i had two i had two like back braces that i wore when i, operated I was about to it. ask about your back. i had a fan inside of the puppet and i had smart. a couple of bottles of water inside of the puppet smart as well there's room. I was in the best <laughs> shape of my life when I did that puppet, though. I was in the best shape of my life. It was incredible for the abs and the core, everything. Arms. It was great. I bet. I loved it. I was so pleased with my performance in that show. And I got a lot of compliments and praise cool. from my work. That that was when I contacted my friend, Paul Pistore, who I hadn't hey talked to in a while. But we were friends on Facebook. And I said, okay, Paul, you got to tell me. How does one make puppetry a career yeah and he said okay i have a couple of people that you should talk to so i reached out to the people that he told me to reach out to and one person got back to me and that was um michael earl the late michael earl uh he had just opened a puppet school in sherman oaks in los angeles dude and he said come and come and take some classes and see what you think i didn't know it at the time but michael earl is the original uh, mr snuffleupagus from sesame street who trained under jim henson that's so cool so i started taking classes with him and then i got invited to and then i took uh, theatrical puppetry classes with this amazing puppeteer christian anderson who was the uh trekkie monster as part of the touring company of avenue q cool and then i got invited back to start teaching classes and that's how that whole thing took off i've gotten to do avenue q kind of um three times i mean I've, I've done the show twice and then i've done kind of avenue q a third time on hbo that's so cool i've also seen i think it's a proof of concept but all the scenes from Cowboys and Engines? Yes, Cowboys and Engines. As a Firefly fan, that seems like the coolest gig ever. So this was actually um, written and directed by a good friend of mine, um, Bryn Pryor, who uh, he is a huge fantasy nerd and um, my God, he has he has one of the biggest like figuring collections I've ever seen in my oh, entire yeah? life of like beautiful, beautiful statues and things. Yeah. Um, I met Bryn, God, like in 2004, 2000, no, it must've been before that, 2003, I'll say that. Uh, he was like a friend I made when I moved to Los Angeles and we just, we hit it off. We became really good friends and we've been friends ever since. He was even at the party, but he had to leave very quickly because his um, wife was sick and he had to take her to urgent care, unfortunately. Oh, no. I think actually 
I might have been living with Bryn at the time. I've been his roommate like on three different occasions. Nice. Um, when I've like been be- in between like places and stuff, I'm just be like, "Yo, do you have a place that I can <laughs> you know crash for a few months?" And he's Those like, "Yeah, come friends. on over." Because he always he always lives in like these amazing um reconverted warehouses, like these cool work work live spaces. So we always he had usually had room. Uh, I think he finally has settled down into a house with his wife yeah. now. <laughs> so yeah, I think I might have been his roommate at the time. And this was actually, uh, I had moved back to Bakersfield um, for a year when I was 31. Um, it was after, it was actually after I did a little shop. Mm-hmm. I moved back to Bakersfield that summer um because uh I was I wanted to be closer to my family at the time and my daughter and I like transferred back to my old college to finish out my bachelor's I didn't do it but that was the the main intent sure but at the same time um my one another theater company that I was friends with um they were doing a production of Avenue Q. Cool. Um, and this was the first production that I actually did of it. And they asked if I could come. They first asked if I could make the puppets and then assist uh, the guy who was coaching all the puppetry. He oh. ended up not being able to coach the puppetry and they just ended up having me do it. So I made all of the puppets and then I coached the show. And then I also played um, Lucy. It was super fun. After that year, though, and I think I did another show after that. I can't remember. Anyway, I moved back to LA to then teach a puppet school and do another production of Avenue Q. Killing it. Um, and th- that was like the main one. The huge production of Avenue Q that I did was back in, in Los Angeles. And after I was done with that production, Bryn had finished writing Cowboys and Engines. And I mean, and it was a full script. It was a, it was a full movie, everything. Um, and he just asked if I wanted to help uh, produce it, cast it, all of that stuff, just assist him in in making it because we were definitely aiming to get some bigger names on the film. And so we did, we went into pre-production um, and we, we I, I made all the casting, you know, the casting uh, calls for it and we held casting. I was not originally in the movie. Oh. Um, we, ca- we cast another girl who was wonderful. She was super talented. She just she just came across a little too young on mm-hmm. screen sure and sometimes you know this as an actor sometimes that's all that it is sure Stuart townsend was aragorn first dude got booted look too young yeah it'll happen so i finally i think there was a night after we had had casting or we had had our first read through i don't remember what it was we went out to dinner we had uh, gotten some wine. It was Bryn and I and the producer. And I think Richard Hatch was with us at the time too. Cool. Um, but Richard had left and we were sitting there. And I think I had just been enjoying myself a little too much that I went, <laughs> okay, can I finally read for this role, please? Look at you. Like, can I finally just read for the role? Yeah. Um, I just got ballsy. Why and, not? and I did. And they were like, okay, it's yours. I, I auditioned. I did do an audition. I auditioned for the director and the producer because the producer had never seen me perform before ever. Sure. And so I did a reading the next day for them. And like after they went outside and talked forever, <laughs> or at least it felt like it. Little deliberation. He finally came back in. He's like, he's like, all right, start, uh, start getting cut for a little while. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, we went into production and I got to work with, three of the most talented men in science fiction yeah, <laughs> that I've ever heard I would say with. so. Walter, you know, Walter Koenig, Richard Hatch, and Malcolm McDowell. My God, what a dream. Dude, when I was uh, watching, incredible. I was like, what? Who's in this movie? It was everything. You got yeah. Star Trek, Battlestar, and every insane. horror movie ever. Just, oh. Yeah. And you had scenes <laughs> with him, and you nailed it. Like, good yeah, for you. Yeah, well, you know. That's when you're awesome. the lead, you yeah, see with everybody. <laughs> I guess Richard Hatch was technically the lead. When you're the yeah, lead female or whatever. Yeah. Um, but and I got to smooch, you know, Richard Hatch, which was you awesome. Did? You did. You got to be all cool <laughs> in yeah. the beginning, be like, "Yeah, I'm gonna take your horse." You got to. I got you... to be super cool. It was my Han Solo moment. Yeah, it's the best. Ro- How much of that was real? How much of which part was real? That's a good point. Uh, we'll start with the horse. Because you had a you had a, a mechanical horse I, that you rode up on. I did ride, I did ride the horse. There was a real horse that I did ride. Okay. okay. Um, 
I even I even wrote it off screen at a pretty good gallop, but it wasn't nice. exactly what they needed. So I did have a double for the the very fast horse sure um going away so we had a real horse on set but we also had a stand-in horse that was entirely metal oh cool. on set so that when i am standing next to the metal horse and everything yeah. that is that is a, a metal horse that they had that, that they created it it was incredible um yeah uh this woman carrie and andy appleton they were our our set designers and prop makers and everything they did a really really incredible job with that the whole time i was like this has to be the most fun job you're like having shootouts there's blimps there's well like i mean even all, all of the guns, you know, these yeah. like these old replica guns that had been like retrofitted to look like steampunk or laser guns. Like it was very, very neat. And Richard Hatch is like the nicest person on the face of the planet. Cool. And Walter Koenig, also very, very sweet. Just very old. Yeah. You know, <laughs> sweet guy. Very nice. Uh, so old. Malcolm McDowell was terrifying. To I bet. With. But only because... He is one of those actors that just goes off script and just oh. starts saying whatever he really? wants. He just ad libs throughout the scene. And I'm sitting there going, I'm not used to <laughs> no. not saying these That's lines. The I didn't I didn't have any I didn't have any rehearsal time. Yeah. So I had to go like I had to figure it out just on the spot and go like, oh my God, how can I respond to this and still make wow. it about what the scene is supposed to be about? But oh, it was so terrifying to me. So I was I think I was. 32 when we shot that yeah so that was 10 years wow. ago that's 10 and a half years ago yeah so how, how did it go like at the end dancing with mcdowell like that like you got to walk away from the scenes like whoo huh ah, all right all right <laughs> we we had him for one day we had him for one day that was it it was like we either get those shots with him you did that in a day mm -hmm. oh my god yeah it was like either we get these shots with him or we don't that's why he's like monologuing as a bad guy with a with a mechanical eye on a blimp being like this is my moment. With a mechanical eye. And now he's bad living. That's what a crazy experience. And then you've got to like go toe to toe. And here's the thing. You don't know what happens in that shootout cuz we cut away right before the shootout happens. So Ooh. My goodness. I I wish there are so many we also originally um another badass from science fiction uh we had scenes that we were definitely going to shoot that we ended up just not being able to shoot um and one of those was with um this sheriff character and it was going to be played by rico ross from Ooh, aliens Ooh, yeah oh and Ooh. rico is just so cool yeah. Um, but I, we never got to work together and i'm just like oh i wish we could have had those scenes and sure yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a cool cat though. Yeah. Next time. Next time. I know. I like when those kind of things converge. When you see like, just, I don't know, just looking at the, the tapestry of someone's life. It's like, this was a thing that happened. I call myself the queen of almost. It's a terrible nickname to, to give <laughs> oh, <no>. yourself. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of projects that I have worked on that were like, almost a thing or like even even puppetry and stuff and like the ability to work with um like the jim henson company i've just i've i've not been able to to get my hooks in it everything that i've done has either been something that another person has created and have just asked me to uh, help be a part of or i even like there was even I was working on a puppet pilot. I wrote a pilot that was a puppetry pilot Dude. Um, with a really talented guy. And I had a couple of producers who were really interested in it. But my connection to those producers was with somebody that I was working for. Um, and that ended really, really badly. Mm. And so I lost that connection and just wasn't able to, to move forward. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a struggle. It's weird how that <laughs> as, works. As isn't most it? things are. Yeah. As most things are in Los Angeles. It's like you, you go down these roads and you're like, this one didn't go where I thought, but then uh, the key is just perseverance, right? Cause there's roads and roads and roads and roads. That's the thing that's, and that, I think that's one of the reasons that I sort of, um, over the past few years, especially, I mean, like the pandemic aside, sure, it's it's been hard for me to find representation in Los Angeles that knows what to do with me. Sure, I've had a lot of agencies in the past ten years sign me because they see puppeteer on my resume, oh. but they don't represent puppeteers, so they don't know what to do with puppeteers on their roster. 
Oh, so um, weird. I think in the 10 years, in the 10 years that I've been represented by an agent who has signed me as a puppeteer, I've had two puppetry auditions. Really? Yeah. And so I'm just kind of like, I, I would rather find work in the puppetry community on my own totally than try to go through an agent that doesn't know what to do with somebody who has the skills that I have. Absolutely. Well, it's like when you know what you can do, but then having somebody else understand, I feel you. I feel yeah. you in my soul with that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. I, and we've, you know, you and I've had this talk before. I get it. Yeah. So it's one of the reasons that I've kind of, I've, I've resigned myself to, to mostly being a theater actor, but sure, it's not even a resignation. It's, it's more or less because I'm more passionate about theater than I am about me. Totally making television and movies would it be nice to have television movie money sure yeah. <laughs> but Always. does it feed my soul the way that being on stage does no way no not at all I get to meet amazing people I get to work with amazing people but I I love I love doing theater so much and yeah you know all the all the amazing people in the industry that I meet now I just meet through Walt <laughs> yeah he's a great litmus to go through He's he's been my, my filter God, as well. he he is like <laughs> he is like the networking hub. I just yes. Yes. Oh my God. That's what, that's why my nickname should be for him now. The networking hub. Yes. It's a way to go. But yeah, I just, he's like, Oh, I'm working on this thing. You want to come meet these people? I'm like, yeah. I mean, Oh my God. I've met Yuri and Tara through him. Mm -hmm. I've met Nolan and Troy. I I'm trying to like, think of like all the amazing, I've met Todd. Right. His wife. I've met Jim Peary, like all the people yeah, that you time. have now interviewed. I have, I have met because yeah. of Walt. Yeah. Even uh, Richard, who was um, Sully in uh, Uncharted, we got to spend time with him on our honeymoon when we went to Maine. We got to go see him and visit him. And he is lovely. Oh, He's so I wonderful. That. I love yeah. that. You picked a good one. Walt, just, Walt is so lovely and he is such a magnet for good people. Yeah. So I mean, he's I. You know, we don't want him to get too big of a head. He, he's, he's okay. <laughs> if you're into that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I I very much am. Yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's a good balance for me cuz I I'm like I'm the mean one. There's always a mean one in the relationship, right? There has to be. Right? I'm the mean one and he's the nice one. Yeah. It's so the yin yang. You know, balance each other. Out. I get it. With the, as the last name of balance, I get it. I understand. 100%. <laughs> I I love when there's the Venn diagram of people who have multiple skills that come together because yes. I have seen you do puppetry in Big Little Lies on a stage, yes. which is the full, it's theater, it's TV, <laughs> and it's puppetry. You're doing puppetry in a theater, on TV. It's Boom. insanity. You're a multi-hyphenate, yeah. Libby. But you kill it. <laughs> For Reese Witherspoon, nonetheless. Look at you. She is an absolute sweetheart. Cool. She is an absolute sweetheart. She was lovely. Um, Adam Scott was also he. It's so funny. I've had a crush on Adam Scott for years. Um, so. but it was it was so interesting. Um, because he is so um soft spoken and introverted. Oh, and he's also such a nerd that when we had downtime on set and like all the puppeteers were like up on stage separate from everyone, mm -hmm. Adam like walked up to the stage and he's like, I'm gonna. Hang out with puppeteers and just ask them all these questions about puppetry yes it was so much fun My we, were, man. we were like yes ask us anything what do you want to know and that was also how we found out he was wearing a fake beard for part of those scenes because he had shaved it between uh the show the, like filming and and uh pickups sure so we were part of the the pickups in los angeles so they filmed all that stuff up in monterey and then the theater scenes were filmed um in hollywood oh interesting yeah did you have rehearsals um, well, okay. So the Avenue Q team in Big Little Lies uh -huh. um, was actually comprised of the cast that I did it with in Hollywood in uh, 2011. Oh, cool. So they actually, they found us um, because they didn't want to have to train people to be puppeteers or to learn Avenue sure. Q songs for those two scenes. They wanted people that already knew it understandable and since we were already kind of a, com a, a complete cast um, i think there were only two people that came in that re replaced uh two of our original cast mm -hmm. um and they were the humans not puppeteers got it so we were already a full group um, oh okay and so that was really really that was really really nice so we didn't really have to rehearse all that much i mean we had like a couple of days of rehearsal just to remember like oh yeah we hadn't done this in three years so let's <laughs> let's try and do it again but yeah i think i think we filmed that in 2015 
is when we did okay. Big Little Lies. How long was that shoot? <laughs> we got held on the shoot for a few days where we ended up shooting nothing. Okay. So we, we got paid for being on set and not actually getting to our scene. Uh, there were also a few days that we got held that we didn't even go to set, but they were like, we need to hold you for these days just in case um, we film. And then when we actually went to film, I think it was only a day of shooting. Wow. And that was it. But it was such a huge, it was an overnight shoot though. Oh. It was so huge. And there were so many uh, background actors in the theater. Well, because it was shot on at the same time as some of the outdoor party scenes in Big Little Lies oh. where they're all dressed up like Audrey Hepburn and Elvis characters. Right. Okay. So because those both took place, the outdoor scenes of the theater is the loc- the outdoor location of the interior of the theater, even though oh. I think there might be two different locations in the show. Sure. So they were using the exterior of that theater for the big outdoor party. Got it. So they were filming a lot of things at the same time. And that's why it was an overnight shoot. Uh, but yeah, I, I still think we did it in like a day. But yeah, it might have been like 12, 12 hours, 14 hours, maybe. I don't remember. It was seven years ago. Yeah. I know. yeah. So it was a little bit. Just a little bit. We were hoping... We were hoping that the puppeteer, the puppeteer theater company, would come back for season two, but no such luck. You sh- you shown, shown, shined, shown. It's shown. It shined. It's for sure shined. Past tense of shine. <laughs> Whatever that is, too bright. Shined. <laughs> you shined too bright. <laughs> we shined too brightly. I have for sure made up other words on this show before. <laughs> you shown too bright. Well, yeah, you, you have know? to. You have to. Shakespeare did it, and I'm. The same. You have to. Shakespeare did it all the time. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> We're exactly the same. <laughs> Amazing. Exactly the same. Yeah. I, I mean, I see it every day. Exactly. They didn't call him Bill Shakespeare for nothing. So how did how did Schooled happen? Because I really enjoyed Schooled. You're Schooled. Puppet. Yes. Oh my God. Schooled was so fun. I loved it. Um, that was a little project. Have you taught have you met Seth Austin yet? I don't think so. Connect me. Okay. Um, Seth is a wonderful performer and stunt performer that Walt has worked with several Amazing. times. Seth uh, did a lot of the stunt and motion capture performance for Spider-Man. Oh, great. So I met Seth and his uh, now wife, Jenny, through Walt, of course. Of course. Because Walt knows all the best people. As you do. Um, Seth, Seth and Jenny have their own little mini production company. They make content all the time. It's called uh, Shots by Jeff. J E T H for it. Jenny and I love it. Um, they're they're both just insanely talented. It's ridiculous, but um, they they wrote this little music thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Seth was like, you know what? I really want to do this with puppets. Um, so he asked Walt to talk to me, and he's like, I really want to do it though, like with sock puppets. So they came over one day. I pulled out all of my arts and craft supplies. And we all made our own sock puppets based on the characters that Seth and Jenny had written. Yeah. And then we went over to their place and we recorded the voiceover first. Okay. And then I was wondering. we used the voiceover and song as playback to shoot the scenes with. I unfortunately, it was so funny. I actually only got to shoot the sock puppet stuff, the puppetry stuff, only one day with them. The oh. rest of the time, that was all them and Walt shooting all the other, all the other stuff. Really? Yeah. But it, oh my god, it was so much fun. It, it reminded it. me. So there's another, there's another thing online. I don't know. You'll probably be able to find it. Uh huh. Um, it's called the Penis Song. So I made penis puppets for another friend who has a song called the Penis Song that's on YouTube. Got and it. that was back in 2012. So, uh, yeah, a friend of mine, after we had done Avenue Q, so actually this might have been 2013, yeah. um, after we had done Avenue Q, uh, a friend of ours who had seen the show, he said, hey, I've got this idea for a song called Penis Song, and I really want some, like, Sesame Street-looking penises. Classic. So I will send you a link <laughs> Please uh, do. to that one, because it is <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and so it's it's really really fun um it was written by a guy named uh, ben palacios who is stupidly handsome but i just found out that he did the motion capture uh for the crocodile in the new lyle the crocodile movie oh how cool is that random 
<laughs> random. Who knew? So you you recorded the voiceovers first, and then did the puppets yes. do the voiceovers? Yeah. So we used we used the uh, voiceovers as playback, and then recorded gotcha. everything. Gotcha. Man, that must have been voiceover. tough. I'm trying to yeah. think. Yeah. It's. I guess it's kind of similar to. Well, it's like making a music video. Yeah, and like you had your uh, giant uh, shop of horrors puppet to somebody else's voice, but that's live and it's different, so it's yeah, not quite the same. Live. Man, I wonder how many takes it took. With something like a with something like a theatrical performance, you rehearse for so long and you get to know the little um, nuances that that person is doing with their voice or the lines, so you can match your movement to go like, oh, I know that they're going to do this right here. So let me match this movement to that. I mean, if she did a run, I, you know, I made my body, I made my little puppet body. There you go, a little, 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 little puppet little run. Move, little puppet run. Um, but yeah, doing it, doing it to a, a voiceover track is much more difficult, I think, especially when you're only, you know, you're doing it. I mean, we, we didn't do like a million takes. I did tell them though, and this is something that I learned when I worked with Michael Earl, uh, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, who did Team America World Police. Michael actually worked as one of the marionette puppeteers on the movie. Oh. And I, he, um, I guess he said he was in the lunch line with them one day and, and they were talking about a shot or, or timing or something. Mm-hmm. And Michael, Michael kind of said to them over his shoulder, he's like, well, if we get it done by then or something like that. And they're like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you know that everything takes twice as long when you're filming puppets. And they're like, what? Uh-huh. And that apparently pissed them off a lot. Oh, no. And um, after that project, I think they said they would never work with puppets again. <laughs> uh, because it does. Everything with puppets takes twice as long. Um, and you you have to have the right equipment. You have to be prepared for things happening um and i told that to seth and jenny when we first when they first decided to do this i said just so you know everything tw- takes twice as long with puppets and they're like perfect they're like oh well, all right <laughs> like, oh, okay. did you have a monitor to work yeah, on yeah you have to okay that's what i was like i told no them we couldn't. had to yeah yeah you you have to um it is near impossible to film puppetry uh above you if you're not doing theatrical puppetry if you're doing camera puppetry uh, to do anything without monitors you have to have monitors below that you can look at we didn't have a below we had um we were oh. all on the floor on pillows and the cameras were just set very oh. high which i don't recommend <laughs> we just like tried to get our ha- hands Perfect. out of you know the frame it, it's um it's a feat henson has it worked out man they they build sets above you know head level oh yeah and so everybody's just standing under the set which is great that's that's what you want but that's not how to do it but... have that production level sure yeah exactly i mean it came out really well it's really good it's adorable it's, it's so adorable. good i love it it's so cute that that's literally that's all seth and jenny i i'm gonna give them all the credit on that one i mean and walt is hilarious too I mean, he's Stop all right. Puppets. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep him humble, Libby. We, we're saying too many nice things about him, you know? <laughs> I, You know what it is? It's because we just got married. So that's what, you know what? That's fair. Oh, I feel, I'm like, I'm in that, I'm in that honeymoon world right you're, now. You're allowed to still love him. I'm going to make up stories. I want to compliment him and say nice things. Right, right. That makes sense. Because before that, I mean, I I never complimented Walt. I told everybody all of his biggest flaws. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so now that you don't do that anymore, I have to pick up the mantle and I'll do it. I'll do okay. it. Okay. All right. For the benefit of right. I think it's a nice balance. You know, it is. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Now we have to talk about the Millie show it was uh, so weird show. and hilarious. Yay! And the sign gag made me laugh every single time. Every single oh, I'm good. I'm dumb. So I every every time somebody walk in, that show is bonkers. How so how? the Millie <laughs> <laughs> The Millie show, um the Millie show was uh created by this wonderful woman, um, Camilla, who is yep. Millie. Um, she, she was doing her own thing. She was very, very good friends, um, 
oh my god i'm gonna completely forget everybody's names now because it's been a really long time it's been a while it's okay they can look it up it has been a while it has been a while anyway uh they were two gentlemen that i worked on another movie um called the prey and they they found out that i was a puppeteer and they're like hey um we're doing this thing called the millie show and she has a puppetry co-host but this this co-host is actually based on a woman that we know oh. and apparently i mean the, the i don't know if the name is real debbie maniscalco but that's the name of the puppet sure. <laughs> but there's this there's this woman named debbie who used to call all the time that used to call someplace i don't know if it was like a if, if it was like a education thing Sure. Some kind of acad some kind of academic whatever. But she would call and she would like say really nasty things about um Neil deGrasse Tyson all the time. She like really she had a huge crush on him. Sure. Um, she was obsessed. So she would always call and like say these things about him. Anyway, they told me kind of they gave me like a rough sketch of what they thought she looked like. And I created the puppet based on that sketch. And I did the the voice and everything, and they were like, "Oh my god, this is perfect!" <laughs> so there is a there is a video of me on my Facebook page on the on the professional Facebook page. There is a, a video of me as Debbie Maniscalco saying the absolute nastiest stuff about Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> so hopefully, one of these days he sees it. I'll, I'll try and put it on Twitter and tag him. I don't know, but. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah, um, that was one of my favorite puppetry projects to work on, The Millie Show. Um, sure. And if anybody wants to look for it, you can find it on Amazon Prime. I think there are seven episodes and each one is like 99 cents to yeah. download. Worth it. But so they're, worth it. They're just absolutely incredible. They're very much, the humor is very much along the same lines as like the Tim and Eric show. It's so good and weird very it's weird so but i like it a lot yeah it's so <laughs> strange it's bizarre but i've i've you know you meet there's a lot of comedians that have gone on the show and uh it was incredible yeah just silliness all the way around one of one of my favorite one of my favorite projects ever did you have a monitor for debbie because you because she kind of moves around a bunch and is interacting with other people as well there there are times when i did have a monitor like when i'm stationary on the chair for most of the time now i just winged it that's so <laughs> crazy <laughs> <laughs> you got to be malleable. It was fun. You have to be. You have to be. So what, When at this point now in your career, you're loving theater, you're loving poetry, yeah. you're loving just just acting. What What is something like, what would be the perfect dream job? Do you have one in your mind? Like, I would love to do this of this. If I could, if money didn't exist. Yes. If money didn't exist. Totally. And I could just produce theater all the time. Yeah. I would do it. Really? Yeah. Okay. And that way I have the option to act. I have the option to direct, which I love. I, I want to do more directing. I love directing. Yeah. You've been um, directing. If I just had all the money to have my own theater company, yeah. which also meant having a home for that company, having sure. a theater at my disposal, that's, that's what I would absolutely do. Yeah. But that is so hard in Los Angeles, California. I bet. There's theaters everywhere they're t for the most part they're tiny the big theaters are going to be like your professional theaters your amundsen's your your uh geffen's your um you know what's the other one the center center theater group ctg those are going to be your big theaters and those are going to be your professional theaters and by professional what i mean is that they hire tv actors to come in and do theater <laughs> different crap and and you know on it and here's the thing some of those tv actors are really great we got to see uh, Brian Cranston and Brandon Scott Dude. in a show um, a few months ago at the Geffen. It was phenomenal. I phenomenal. Bet. But not every theater experience when I'm watching film and TV actors up on stage is like that, unfortunately. And the ones who do it well are people that have theatrical training. Totally. It's a different medium. It's a different medium. Um, but yeah, give me a large theater and uh, all the money. Yeah. And I will produce some wonderful theater for you. I'm, I love I, that's it. all I want to do. Yeah. Do you have, I'm going to, I'm not going to put you in the corner and limit it to one. Okay. But I will limit it to three. Do you have three favorite plays? Three favorite plays. I know, right? Uh, Blues for an Alabama Sky. Ooh, solid. One of my favorites. Um, I saw it at the Ashland, Oregon Shakespeare Festival 
in 1997 and it blew me away absolutely yeah. blew me away um love that play it is it is so heartbreaking um trying to think other plays that i just absolutely love i'm gonna uh, this is this is me being completely biased good this is me being completely biased my uh aunt her name is barbara Lindsay, by the way or babs Lindsay. love it wrote this incredible play called the walkers and Ooh. i had the privilege of directing it a few years ago oh, cool. um unfortunately i it was for like one night or two nights only i can't remember um and the stage was way way too tiny to do the show but i had a wonderful <laughs> cast but when i saw when i saw her the first time when she did it or when she wrote it and i saw it it produced for the first time i think i was like 14 mm -hmm. and richard heard um played oh. the father in the show and god he was just incredible I, everybody yeah. in the show was incredible but he was amazing um, I would love to do that show again, give it like a real run, give it a, a bigger stage. And um, I have, I have some thoughts on, on the cast that I would mm -hmm. want to put in, put in it. Um, that is one of my favorite plays. I love that play. Um, and then, I don't know. I don't know yeah. after that. Okay. I, there's too I'll many. Take a top I, ha two. I have a love of. I have a love of Shakespeare. I have a love yeah. of musicals. God, West Side Story is one of my favorite musicals. Les Mis is one of my favorite musicals ever. Um, I have seen I have seen that show live more times than I think any other musical that I've seen. Really? And I mean, like, I mean, gorgeous performances. I've seen it up in I I thought at Utah at Cedar City Shakespeare a few Ooh. years ago. I have seen it live at the Pantages. I think I saw it live in Bakersfield for the very first time when I was young. Cool. Um, I, I, God, that's probably, it's probably my favorite musical of all time. And I know, I know that it can be a little cliche, but I just, every time Doesn't I matter. see it, I just weep. I weep. I respect it. I weep. I love it so much. I love it so much. Is there any advice that you have for someone who is just wanting to get into puppetry or theater or anything of that nature? For somebody who just wants to get into theater? Mm-hmm. I would say ask around, find somebody who is already part of an established company. Smart. See if they're holding auditions and then just go and audition or find out if the company does um, open workshops and just go like take some workshop classes. Um, I would also highly suggest not paying for anything that you don't need because ah, I like that in Los Angeles, if in Los Angeles, everybody's asked to pay for anything. You want to meet this casting director, you have to pay this much money. You want to take this workshop, you have to pay this much money. I understand people need to make a living. I totally get it. But mm -hmm. people who are trying to break in this industry do not have all of the money in the world. Heck, I don't even have all of the money in the world to take all of the workshops that I'm supposed to be taking. I hear you. I would say if somebody just wants to do theater, especially in LA, just start small. Yeah, because it's it can be very fulfilling to to be in a tiny black box theater, yeah. but do something that actually, you know, makes you feel something or makes the audience feel something rather than being in a giant space and just being, you know, chorus somewhere. Sure. Even Shakespeare. Heck, do as much Shakespeare as you can. I love Shakespeare. I, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Shakespeare actor. I love doing Shakespeare. I find something new. Every time I do it, I find something new in the language. I find new meaning. It's incredible. And I will say, if you do have the money to do it, Antius Theater Company in Glendale is incredible. And they do amazing, amazing workshops. I've gotten to, I've gotten to study under Armin Shimmerman oh, cool. um, for two of his classes. And he is just an incredible instructor. I don't know if he's if he's doing workshops anymore right now. I you know he's recently written a book and he's been working on that. But regardless, they have incredible teachers there. Incredible teachers. If somebody wants to break into puppetry, unfortunately, the school that I went through, puppet school, was the only puppetry institute that existed outside of an academic institute in the country country and it doesn't exist anymore i would look into the los angeles puppetry guild because there are a lot cool. of resources in the los angeles puppetry guild mm -hmm. um most of those people all work on some kind of puppetry some of them work with disney some of them work with henson 
a lot of them work with the Bob Baker marionette um, theater in Los Angeles as well. Marionettes is a type of puppetry that I do not do. Yeah. <laughs> cannot do it. Can't wrap my head around it. I am not a marionette puppeteer. Those people are sorcerers. Sorcerers. Uh, they really, really are. But I can't do that. There are a few who can. It's incredible. It's beyond my my abilities. My abilities lie with with hand puppets or full body puppetry. But pulling strings, man, that is <laughs> that's a workout right there. You can't do it all, Libby. I can't do it all, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, Los Angeles uh, Puppetry Guild is where I would start if you are in LA and looking to do that. If you are not in LA, uh, I would look to the um, Puppetry Institute in Atlanta, Georgia, and find Ooh. out if they have any resources for places that are, are near to other people. And honestly, what I tell most of my puppeteers who are just starting out is to get a cheap puppet offline. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't like I don't like condoning Amazon, but go on Amazon, buy a cheap puppet and just go in front of a mirror and start practicing because every class that I ever teach is always in front of a mirror because you have to look at yourself. Right. Yeah. Or get a camera and just do it to the camera. And if you have a monitor, look at your monitor and just see where you can fix things. I always tell people find songs that they really like and just have your puppet sing along because that will start training your body to learn how that puppet moves and what that puppet is capable of doing and how that puppet looks to other people if you're doing it on a monitor or to a mirror. Yeah, that's so cool. I never thought about that. You can literally just make eyeballs that fit. On, just I get two ping pong balls, glue them to an elastic strap, Put little black dots on the ping pongs, and then your hand is a puppet. Boom. You don't even need to get a fancy puppet off of Amazon. Right. Your hand is the <laughs> puppet. Come on, guys. Your hand is the puppet. That's why they're called hand puppets. <laughs> I love it. And just like that, Libby, yeah. we've been talking for over an hour already. You survived. I'm proud of you. My God. I did it. <laughs> <sighs> it's a long time coming. I told Walt, I, I'm like, I'm so, I, I was so, I'm not, I wasn't nervous about talking to you because obviously it's just like talking to a friend now because we've, we've met and you're so lovely. Stop it. But I was just like, you talk to so many incredibly talented and like pretty famous people. I mean, people that people know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I am not somebody that a lot of people know. <laughs> so I Yet. feel, I feel honored to be counted among them all now. So thank you. Of course. See, that, I that's the thing. You. I talk to people who I find interesting, and that's anybody. And you are Yay. just as oh, interesting as, any, as the rest <laughs> of them. You know? Oh, that reminds me. Speaking of Walt, and speaking of interesting stories, and speaking of surviving, I have to ask you about a story where yes. you, yeah. say you there was a house fire, and you saved a child by chucking him out a window. He might have put it differently. <laughs> But that's how I'm putting it. <laughs> I mean, he didn't he didn't put it that way, but I'm putting it that way because that's how my brain works. I yeeted. I just you yeeted, yeeted right that out. child. <laughs> um, that child, that child was my child. So you had more than right to. <laughs> um, when my daughter was two months old, uh, we lived in the second story of an apartment complex in Bakersfield, and we uh, woke up. I say we, my my ex-husband, her father and I woke up in the middle of the night. It, it was summertime, all it was like May in Bakersfield, which is hot as balls. Of course. We woke up in the middle of the night. It was so hot, but we heard a commotion going on outside. And we opened the blinds, the window that was like behind our bed. So the way that the apartment complex was set up is like, there was like four apartments, like two downstairs, two upstairs, and then another building next to it, two downstairs, two upstairs. And then another building next to it. So it was like kind of like a complex of quadruplexes, that Got kind it. of thing. We looked out the window and we could see a glow on the building next to us. Oof. And we're like, oh, there must be a fire. Like one of the other buildings must be on fire, like across the parking lot or something. Sure. So we're like, let's go check it out. I opened our bedroom door and our living room was in flames. Oh, no. Yeah. So our living room was was just a wall of fire. Um, I mean, it was still about like, you know, four feet. Uh, there's still like a hallway that you would go into and then into the living room. So I'm I'm in the hallway looking through the doorway into my living room on fire. So um, I kind of freak out and yeah. he, he like kind of holds me and he's just like, hey, go get the baby. And I'm like, right. Um, so 
there's smoke in the hallway. So I kind of, I duck under the smoke and I go Smart. into her bedroom and we have, the, we had the door closed to her room because we had cats at the time sure. and we didn't let the cats go into her room when she was sleeping. Mm -hmm. Um, so I open her door. Her room is clear as a bell, no smoke in it. Amazing. She's just chilling in her crib because she's, you know, a two month old baby. Of course. Chill, chill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I grab her, I put her face in my chest. I duck back down under the smoke because now the smoke's starting to go in her room. Go back into our bedroom. He has pulled the bed away from the window, has the window up, and our neighbors are downstairs yelling at us, obviously, because they're like, get out of your fucking apartment. There's a fire. <laughs> um, so we threw a blanket. We took a blanket off of the bed, just grabbed a quilt off of the bed and threw it down to the neighbors, had them hold it out, the blanket, and I just tossed. I did not that. chuck. Uh. I tossed. Gently, tossed my little, baby down a cartoon out slide. of the window, okay. out of the window, into the blanket. I was not as graceful. I just jumped out the window. Fair, because you have legs that work. What are you going to do? There was there was no, no ladder. Uh, I thankfully still have legs that work after that because there it was probably go. a fifteen foot jump because you know second story. And then yeah, my my ex husband kind of shimmies down the wall good for him because i did not do that <laughs> um and so yeah and then i i was hysterically saying like please give me my baby back and they're like just calm down for a second i'm like no no please give me my baby back i want to hold her <laughs> i need that uh and then um we took the most expensive taxi ride ever uh meaning an ambulance ah, to yes. the hospital for smoke inhalation classic and then um we were in the hospital in Let's see, that was one in the morning. We were in the hospital until about 5, 5.30 in the morning just to get oxygen, make sure our lungs were cleared up and everything. Uh, and then we went to my mom's house. My mom was actually out of town at the time. So we went to her house and I found her spare key and got inside and tried to sleep, but could not. Fair. Um, a lot of yeah, adrenaline. That, uh, that happened. That happened. Ooh. There's a lot. There's a lot in my life where people are going like, wait, this is really your life. I, I, I'm sure you know that I'm a cancer survivor as well. Amazing. Okay, you did. So there's that. Um, so cancer, you know, your apartment burning down, a couple of marriages under my belt, baby. You know, See, all, you know. And you say you're not as interesting. This is what I'm talking about. See? <laughs> No, my life is interesting. My <laughs> life is very interesting. I, I don't yeah. think I'm that interesting. <laughs> that's what i'm here for we are the culmination of our experiences you got actor writer and then house fired baby saver boom look at this Lydia. <laughs> look at us you got so many things going for you <laughs> baby chucker i prefer baby, baby chucker. chucker thank you thank you i'm here for you this is what i do <laughs> i love it i love it i'm in uh before i release you back into the wild though i have to ask where can people find you online where can they find your stuff talk to me oh my gosh well <laughs> I'm on IMDb, although I don't think my pro account is even like up to date. So there's no picture of Who me, needs it? <laughs> uh, but there are, there are pictures there you mm -hmm. can find. Um, so Libby Letlow on IMDb. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram all the time. And that is at Ribby Retro. So R-I-B-B-Y-R-E-T-R-O-W. That's a Scooby-Doo joke. Mm -hmm. I dig it. I am I am on I am still on Twitter. Yep. Uh, We're going down with it. At yeah, Libby underscore gets underscore low. Boom. Look so at Libby this. Libby gets low, but underscore between the words. And then um I'm on I'm on Facebook as Libby Letlow Gray, but I'm never on Facebook. So right? <laughs> you'll be you'll be disappointed. There I do have like a professional uh puppetry page on Facebook. It's just you know Libby Letlow actor producer performer or puppeteer i don't remember what it says sure uh that that is there it does have access to a lot of like old videos links to things i've done online so you'll see youtube things again i can't thank you enough for for asking of course it really it, it meant a lot you're the best libby you're the best brian i appreciate you hey
Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.